Nate and I got a new grill. Now, if you know anything about the Fergusons, you know that we got the top of the line 1999 model, right? And what I mean by that is it's not a Blackstone, no, no, no. Not even a smoker, no, no, no. This is the kind that comes in the box that you can maybe fit six burgers on. And your job is just to assemble two or three things and then voila, you put the little gas thing that you get at the uh, gas station and you can make burgers. So we get it and we have it in a box and I say to Nate, do we need the instructions? No, we don't need the instructions. You can already see where this is going. There are very few things to connect on this 1995 model. And so one of them is the gas line. And so he gets it all connected, all put together. We, at Carter's out there, it's the two of them. It's just a great time, right? And so we put the gas on and it's one of the real fancy ones that has the red button that you click, click, and it's the igniter, you know? And so click, click, nothing happens. Click, click, nothing happens. Is the gas on? Yes, gas is on. Click, click, nothing happens. Is it the igniter? No, Nate says it's not the igniter. Okay, so, you know, about 30 seconds goes by and the brilliant thought is, let's get the little lighter that you light your um, fireplace with. Can you all see where this is going? Now remember, it's like this silver thing from 1995. It has this big lid and it's shut. And so Nate sticks the lighter <laughs> up underneath. I wish you could see it. And <laughs> it blows up. I mean, and what I mean by blows up is it blows the lid back and it singes Nate's eyebrows. <laughs> it's one of the best stories ever. Like, we talk about it all the time. Have you ever done that in your life? Have you ever unintentionally blown up your life? I mean, you had great intentions. You thought you were doing the right thing. And then all of a sudden, kaboom. Something happened in your life. You're responsible. You had good intentions. But you went off just a bit. Just a bit. And life blew up. Well, that's where we are today. We're going to talk about what happens to us as humans. See, it happens to all of us because we love, we live for, we idolize compromise. If you are human, you have compromised something in your life. You've said one thing, you're all about it until this happens. And then you're like, well, I mean, this one time, it can't be that big of a deal. We're in this series, Key to the Kingdom, and we're exploring God's plan for the kingdom. For us, for you and me, as we look at this little patch of history, we find that the humans in the story we're going to talk about do the exact same thing that we do in our lives. They compromise something great, something they really want in their future for something easier, or for something that feels better right now. We do that in our finances. We do that in all sorts of ways. Now, there are two groups of people that are in this audience every Sunday and every time people watch online. They're a group of Jesus followers. These are people that have decided they're Christians and they are trying to follow Jesus. And so first I want to talk to you. I think that we can relate with compromise because we think a lot, well, we aren't perfect. Of course we aren't perfect. That's what Jesus died for. And I think sometimes we settle into that a little too much. We think things in our brain like, I don't think God meant that. I mean, if God was here right now, I think he'd want me to da, da, da. And we just a little bit
compromise. Now, there's another group of you here that have been pulled along, you're tagging along, or you're peeking in with a little bit of interest. You wouldn't call yourself a Jesus follower. You're maybe not even sure that you believe in God. But here's what I would ask you to think about. I bet compromise has affected you in your life. It might be the very thing that you don't like about churchgoers. They say one thing. They stand up on podiums and shout it. And then all of a sudden, in another part of their life, they cheat on their taxes, or they don't tip the waitress, or they don't do all these things. And that seems so off-putting. How could someone who says they believe in a God compromise like? And so for those of you that are here just peeking in, I'd ask you to stick through the story and ask yourself, what does compromise do in all of humanity? And what's the answer, if not God? So we're in this key to the kingdom. And I want to remind you where we are. So when we go to the Old Testament, sometimes I think we lose people that don't really have a full understanding of how the Bible flows. So I want to kind of put us in the context of history. So if you take the Bible and you know that it's one fluid story, it's a story from beginning to end about God pursuing people, let's figure out where we are in that story. So it starts out in Genesis. We know about Adam and Eve, and then we get to Noah, and then we get to Abraham and all his family, and they start multiplying. And a little bit after Abraham, we get to Joseph, and everybody goes to Egypt because there's been a famine. And then we pick up the story, and about 400 years later, all of God's people are enslaved in Egypt, and we get to Moses, and Moses takes them out, and this is the movie we've all seen where Moses parts the Red Sea. And so we have Moses and we get going that way. And then there's a time, so we're about right here, okay? And then there's a time where God puts military leaders or people called judges that are leading God's people. And then he rises up prophets. And there's this prophet Samuel. And if you were here last week, you heard Nate tell the story, but there's Samuel and he's done a great job of leading the people. And the people come to Samuel and they say, we want a king. And Sam is like, you have a king. He's called God. Like, no, no, no. We want a human king like all the other nations have human kings. We want one. And this is a hilarious story. It's one of my favorite passages in all of scripture is in 2 Samuel. I would encourage you to read it because it's like God is saying, are you sure? Then he tells them, here's what kings are going to do. Here's what kings are going to do. And they're like, Samuel goes back and the people are like, no, we want a king. And God says, literally, God says, listen to them and give them a king. And so this is where we're at. So last week, Nate talked about Saul. He was the good looking one that made really rash decisions. He died in battle, and then we got David. And David was a king after God's own heart, except he made some major problems, like big mistakes, all right? And his reputation was hurt forever. Any of us that have ever studied David know the good and the bad about him. But you know what's interesting? His failures didn't keep him from spending eternity with God. Because God's mercy and grace is so abundant when we bring him our failures. And so after David, then we get to Solomon. And that's where we're going to pick up the story today. So for all of you that love to have your Bible out and follow along, we're going to be in 1 Kings chapter 3 today. For those of you that don't do that and don't know where to find it, the key verses we're going to walk through today um, will be on the screen. But before that next verse comes up, I want to catch you up to where we are in 1 Kings 3. So 
Here's what happens. This is the scripture. Solomon made an alliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and married his daughter. Now, let's go back in the history lesson a little bit. Where did Moses pull the people out of? Egypt. Bad people, Pharaohs, they hated them. They chased them with chariots. Solomon just married Pharaoh's daughter to make an alliance. We've already had a little bit of compromise. He brought her to the city of David until he finished building his palace and the temple of the Lord and the wall around Jerusalem. The people, however, were still sacrificing at the high places because a temple had not yet been built for the name of the Lord. And then we pick up the story. And it says, Solomon showed his love for the Lord by walking according to the instructions given by his father David, except that he offered sacrifices and burned incense on the high places. So let me explain what's happening here. God's people have been all over the place. They've been using the Ark of the Covenant, and there are specific places that the incense and the sacrifices are supposed to be offered to God. But in all the time that has happened, other people, other religions have built up. And around the place, there are these high places where people offer sacrifices to other gods. And Solomon is offering sacrifice to God, Yahweh. But he's doing it where everybody else offers their sacrifices. It's kind of Solomon's way of fitting in. I'm not going to tell you, my people, that you're wrong. But I, I'm still going to, I'm only worshiping Yahweh, but I'm going to do it where you worship your gods. Your servant, so a few verses later, there's a little bit that happens, but a few verses later, we get into the crux of everything that's going on. Your servant is here. This is Solomon talking. Among the people you have chosen, a great people, too numerous to count or number. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? This is Solomon's answer after God said, tell me what you want and I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, I want to be wise. I want to be able to know how to serve you and serve your people. And look at what it says. The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So then he goes on and he says, I will do what you've asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. I'm going to stop here and I want you to think in your brain, who's the smartest person on the earth? So my mind immediately goes, I mean, he's not on the earth anymore, but I would think like Steve Jobs. I would think like, who's really smart? Solomon was smarter than Steve Jobs. Do you think you're smart? No one has ever been on the earth that was as intelligent as Solomon. No one. And I bring this up because we live in the best country in the world where information is available at all times, podcasts, YouTube, everything's available on the internet. And I think that we have this little bit of thing here where we really believe this myth. Knowledge is power. According to scripture, that's not true. No better, do better. Ever heard that? That's a fun one I hear. No better, do better. There's never been and there will never be any human that was wiser than Solomon. And yet, we're going to watch him live a life without contentment. Why? compromise. Then God goes on and he says, moreover, not just wisdom. Solomon, 
I will give you what you've not asked for. I'll give you wealth and honor. I'll give you prestige. I'll give you fame is what he's saying. So that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among kings. And if you walk in obedience to me, and if you keep my decrees and the commands of David, I will give you a long life. And if we could just stop here, it would be such a great story. Have you ever had a great start and a horrible ending? I do. It's called a diet. (laughs) Okay, so I'll start out in the middle, the beginning of the day, and I'm eating right, and I'm eating right, and I'm eating right, and the night ends with pizza and honey buns. Has that ever happened to you? (laughs) That's a sad state of affairs. You should really have a honey bun if you haven't. So here's the reality. We all know this. Complacency is the on-ramp to compromise. So we can have a good marriage and then get tired of working at it. We can have a great job. We can be set in our finances. And then it can go the other way. So we go a few more verses into 1 Kings 11. It says, King Solomon, however, loved many foreign women besides Pharaoh's daughter. Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, Hittites. They were from nations about which the Lord had told the Israelites, you must not intermarry with them because they will surely turn your hearts after their gods. Nevertheless, Solomon held fast to them in love. Listen to this one. He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. What? (laughs) This is an interesting thing that I think we all need to understand. Yes, um, This isn't a man that was all about all these women. Yes, he loved several of them. But I want you to understand the context of culture here. Solomon wanted to be, he got caught up in the power and the honor of being the best king around. And it was culture that the neighboring kings, in order to form alliances would send over wives. This was a way of saying, you want to be in an alliance with me? You don't want to make me mad, do you? Take these wives. This would be the equivalent of today, somebody from another nation coming to our nation, the president putting on a state dinner, and the other king saying, I'm not going. Can't you almost hear Solomon's heart when all this is happening? Can't you think he's saying, well, God, you said I was going to be powerful. You said I was going to be wealthy. And if you want me to be wealthy, and if you want me to be powerful, then I've got to do what culture says to do. Because that's what you said, God. Have you ever done that? Have you ever thought, Well, God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? And then we see, and his wives led him astray. As Solomon grew old, his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord his God as the heart of his father David was. He had a divided heart, And it became a part of a divided kingdom. Ignoring problems in our life will result in failure even when we have good intentions. Nate wanted the grill to work. He didn't have an intention of blowing up the grill. Solomon wanted to have a kingdom that honored God. That was his intention. He 
here's an interesting thing. There's no space for compromising with God. He is full of grace. He is full of mercy. But he's not about compromise. Now, this isn't about living a perfect life. This isn't about I have to be obedient until the day I die or there's no grace or there's no mercy for me. On the contrary, your failings can come before God a thousand times over and over and never be rejected. But he will never accept our compromise. He didn't accept Solomon's, and he won't accept ours. See, I think at the root of compromise, if we really get down there, if we look at what happened to Solomon, and if we really look at the root of our own compromise, it's a belief that either we're smarter than God, Or we're in control of our future rather than him. We have one of those two beliefs that cause us to pick the easy. To pick the right now. Instead of waiting for the future. Or waiting for the blessing of obedience. Our hearts, really, our human hearts, Jesus follower or not Jesus follower, our human hearts are chasing contentment. They're chasing joy and peace. And our heart will never find contentment in compromise. Nate has a funny saying about this when he does marriage counseling. He says, The fastest thing that'll kill your marriage is compromise. One of you has to win. The fastest thing to decreasing our contentment is compromise. Jesus talked about it. He said, as the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. Contentment is joy that is complete. But oh, how we strive. We strive to prove those words wrong. We want to find contentment in our jobs. We want to find contentment in our romance. We want to find contentment in our friends. We want to find contentment in our children. Because finding contentment in a king that doesn't accept Compromise requires a lot of us. And it's hard. And so it feels easier. It feels better in the moment to pretend that's not where contentment is. So what are you asking God to share space with in your life? Solomon was asking God to share space with his ease. I'll just sacrifice here, okay? It's okay, I'll just marry Pharaoh's daughter. It's not a big deal. I'll I'll accept those wives from the kings. It's no big deal. It hasn't changed my adoration of you. What are you asking God to share space with in your life? So I want to talk to the two people in the room again. 
There's some of you who would not call yourself a Jesus follower. You're skeptical, you're peeking in, and you're not sure. And I want to tell you something. Jesus is the key to the kingdom you've been desiring. And I would encourage you to pursue that. And I want you to think about a few things. The key to contentment is Jesus. There are lots of keys to power. There are lots of keys to finance. And there are lots of keys to romance. But the key to contentment is Jesus. And so I want to ask you, do you have the constant feeling of never measuring up? Do you feel like when you have an accomplishment, there's still something that's left void in you? If so, we invite you to accept Jesus. Come up afterwards. Ask me what that looks like. Ask me what it looks like to pursue a relationship with Jesus because we want you to have this key to the kingdom. And then there's another group of you. You call yourself a Jesus follower. You would say, I am a Christian. I love the Lord my God. Then this is the question for you. What do you need to stop compromising and start repenting? See, here's the difference between David and Solomon. David messed up big time. And he came to the Lord and he said, I was wrong. Please forgive me. Let me do right by you. And Solomon said, it's not that big of a deal, God. I still love you. Don't worry about that. The key to contentment as a believer, if you're not feeling it, if you are a believer of Jesus and you don't have contentment, you're constantly striving, you're constantly looking for the next thing, you can't find peace, is obedience and repentance. It's an all-in deal. (laughs) There's no holding a few chips back. When you're in with Jesus, it's all in. It's all in for repentance, but then it's all in for community. It's all in for joy. And it's all in for the weight of the world being lifted off your shoulders and carried by the only one who can, Jesus, the King. Will you pray with me?